Atlántico que organizamos desde la oficina del Parlamento. Good afternoon. Welcome everybody to this dialogue organized by the European Parliament Office in Barcelona on the subject of the Uyghur minority on this anniversary of the Sakharov Prize being given to Ilham Toti and uh, also in uh, with the backdrop of the uh, recent resolution by the European Parliament, this text of the resolution from the European Parliament stresses how the Uyghur minorities' rights uh, uh, are being suppressed. We have with us MEP Isaskun Bilbao from the uh, parliamentary group Renew Europe who nominated Ilham Toti. We also have Dolkun Issa, the president of the International Uyghur Congress. We have uh, Daniel Grasso, who uh, organized the China Cables Initiative uh, investigation in Spain. And Monica Garcia, who will moderate the whole proceedings. We will have a simultaneous interpretation, Spanish, English, English, Spanish throughout the event. You need to connect that option in your Zoom app if you wish to you use the interpretation. And those who wish to can send their questions in through the Zoom chat and Monica Garcia will uh, deal with those. So having introduced everybody, Monica, you have the floor. Your interpreter will just say, Mr. Issa, that uh, he can see you. So any problem, just wave, please. Monica Garcia, thank you very much to the European Parliament uh, Office in Barcelona for organizing this event on this very important subject, the systematic trampling of the human rights of the Uyghur minority in China. I was able to go to three cities in Xinjiang a couple of years ago, and it was really apparent how the Chinese authorities, the, the regime from Beijing is launching this campaign to suppress uh, almost uh, people as well as rights in that region. This is not the first time, but we've had uh, reliable reports from the beginning of the repression. It's almost a textbook example, really, what's happening in Xinjiang. So, not only have we not succeeded in stopping China, but the problems have been getting worse, worse than, for example, in Tibet, no doubt. And it's an overwhelming situation. The Chinese campaign is really to make the Uyghur minority seem insignificant, to make them seem unimportant. They try to erase any reference to, for example, their culture for many reasons. There's um, the matter of uh, Central Asia and Europe. And there's also the fact that uh, Xinjiang is one sixth of the area of China. So without that, the Chinese empire would be, uh, would be in a uh, problem. And as a result of all of that, there's this outrageous trampling of human rights in Xinjiang. There's the uh, camps, for example, the internment camps or concentration camps. So they may call them re-education camps or cultural re-education camps, but they're really concentration camps. Uh, since the times of the uh, Cultural Revolution, there have been such camps, but uh, now it's presented in a different way. They say that uh, the camps are there to re-educate the Uyghurs because they're behind and backward and so on. And it's an idea is to criminalize them, to present them as criminal criminals. Uh, but the point is the Uyghurs are not Han. They're not Han Chinese. Uh, they don't speak in Chinese, they speak a different language, they have a different culture. And these are the differences that really bother China and have given rise to its desire to, to uh, unleash this campaign. And the, the main instrument uh, uh, has been these uh, internment camps or, or political re-education camps, as they call them. It is estimated that 10% of Uyghur population is in these camps today. The, the slightest pretext having, for example, Islamic uh, texts at home uh, is grounds to be put into such a camp or contacts with uh, foreign countries or having family members abroad. And especially if a family member abroad had the uh, effrontery or the daring to speak out against the uh, 
repression of Uyghurs. Those are all reasons uh, to put people into camps. There was a list when I was in, in the region 22 years ago of 51 prohibited telephone apps. And uh, the Chinese are soaking up the telephone signals, absorbing all of the telephone signals from Xinjiang region to analyze them. And uh, depending on what you do with your phone, that's another reason to put you into a camp. And you, once you're in a camp, you may be there for weeks, months, or years. And there are many people who have been there for years, and there's no, no news of them while they're there. In these re-education camps, which are places with barbed wire, security wires, uh, security towers, armed guards, the uh, essential idea is to re-educate people which means teaching them Mandarin Chinese, teaching them Chinese legislation, educating them in this uh, patriotism that is uh, propagated across the rest of the country and try to ensure that there's no cultural discrepancy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Peking. But this is one of the most surreal experiences I've ever seen, the big brother experience, the, uh, the all-seeing eye whereby they can spy on everything that's happening in Xinjiang. Ilham Toti, the uh, activist, a great activist for Uyghur rights, who uh, is uh, has suffered the consequences for his campaign, is an example. And re-education or Chinification, if you like, sinicization. Another way this is done is through these schools. This is one of the most disturbing uh, aspects that I've seen. These are orphanages for children that aren't orphans. These are children who are plucked from their families and are put into these schools where they're given a Chinese name, they're taught. Chinese songs, they're only taught Mandarin Chinese. This is really an experiment in social engineering to try to turn people who aren't Chinese into Chinese. This territory has been occupied by China as part of their territory since 1959. There's been very few threats to this status quo, but the, the, the cultural differences are very real, significant and respectable. And there are other methods used to sinicize the region. Some of them are less visible than others. There's, for example, the destruction of architecture. If you look at old photographs of Xinjiang, old books, the way Xinjiang and her cities looked not many years ago with Islamic architecture, mosques, fascinating architecture, that's all gone. It's been destroyed. This uniform style of Chinese uh, architecture has been implanted and the mosques are either being closed or converted into Chinese re-education centers. And the minarets of the mosques have been destroyed in many cases. Also, so far as I know, at least when I made my program two years ago, at least three traditional cemeteries for Uyghurs had been destroyed. And there's this systematic campaign to annihilate their culture. You can't find any books in Uyghur in bookshops. You, there are no newspapers or magazines, according to what I've read. And Dolkin can probably tell us more than, than I can, but this was a flourishing center culturally with a very strong language and culture and literature. 400 artists, uh, 400 uh, uh, intellectuals, journalists. Who have been, who have suffered from this repression. So this is a tremendous campaign being waged by China to leave nothing to chance. And they're trying to alter the entire cultural identity of a region in such a way that it can be absorbed, can be taken over by uh, China, by the Han Chinese based in Beijing. So that's my introduction. 
just to give you a general idea, uh, I want to give the floor first to Dolkun Issa, who is chairman of the uh, World Uyghur Congress, so that he can tell us more. You have the floor, Mr. Issa. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. First, I would like to thank uh, the European Parliament Bar Barcelona office, uh, Mr. Sergi Barrera, organized this wonderful event. And I'm so happy to share the same panel with uh, Madame Izaskun Bilbo. She actually organized Helps the Uyghurs since many years, 2016, October. She organized, organized a wonderful conference at the European Parliament, mostly religious freedom for the Uyghurs. So I would like to use this opportunity to uh, express my gratitude to her, to her once again. Well, and uh, uh, Monica already explained what was the going on for the Uyghurs. Uh, we call Istriksan, of course, officially in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So, and the current situation of the Uyghur is uh, really dire. And uh, Monica already saying 10 percent total population in the lockdown in the uh, concentration camp. But this number is a UN number. 2018, UN Committee Racial Discrimination Committee uh, and gives this number 1 million. But since then, and the, so many international uh, uh, research institute and this uh, independent scholar already published a report and so many media report, we believe at least 3 million people at the moment and the suffering concentration camp. Uh, that ch today, Chinese government, Chinese Communist Party commits genocide against the Uyghurs. Up the testimony, camp survivor. Today is at least five camp survivor in e Europe. Two in the Netherlands, two in uh, fr uh, French, one is Sweden. They all uh, testimony, te testimony camp survivor and the media documentary like BBC just two weeks ago, one of horrible news they are published. Deutsche Welle, Al Jazeera, Sky News, and also New York Times, Chinese Kabul, and the Karakash List, Aksu List, this all report and Andrea Zen's report show very clearly that there is no other war can be described what's happening for the Uyghur beside the genocide. As they say, today, three million people in the concentration in the concentration camp. But is it really difficult to confirm the number? But 2020, September, first time Chinese government give indirect, first time gives some number, saying from 2014, each year 1.3 million Uyghurs subject to the re-education for vocational training. It is mean if you calculate almost since the four, four years, 7.8 million people targeted for the uh, so-called re-education camp. And the mass sterilization Uyghur women, just last, as I say, BBC report has detailed how Uyghur women are systematically raped, sexual abuse, and the tortures. And the forced labor, modern slavery today. Last year is a ASPI Australian National Policy Institute published a report as um, uh, 82,000 Uyghurs uh, transferred to the, uh, used for the forced labor or the slavery. But Andrea Zen saying the 580,000 Uyghur forced it to you, uh, uh, pick cotton, uh, uh, use the forced labor. And the attempt to destroy uh, Unico Uyghur identity, uh, is Monica already explained this all. And the destruction, physical repression, and of course, and the, uh, if you look at the ASPI report, uh, more than 8,000 the most completely destroyed. Another 8,000 the most partly destroyed. This all uh, uh, gives us number with a satellite image. And the banned Uyghur language, uh, and also separating Uyghur children, more than 580,000 Uyghurs, more than half million Uyghur children separate from the family member. Most of some family and parents in the concentration camp they are targeting to indoctrinate and to be a loyal Chinese Communist Party and the for sex, the Uyghur identity, changing name because it's all four or five years old uh, children. Then the, they are slowly, slowly destroyed the uh, Uyghur identity. And also another serious case, 
uh, Chinese government slowly, slowly start end of 2016 and the uh, uh, beginning of 2017, completely cut all communication between Turkistan and Uyghur and the exile diaspora. I personally, uh, I have lost uh, contact with my family members since uh, uh, April 2017. Last very short telephone communication, my mother was April 2017. Since then, I haven't, uh, I couldn't get any access to my family member. But I could only heard very heartbreaking news. Uh, 2018, July, June, June, 12th of June, I got very heartbreaking news. My mother died. So after I got this, this news, I, I trying to contact my family member. I tried to call my uh, brother, uh, some other relatives, but I couldn't. I couldn't access. Then a couple of weeks later, I learned my mother died one of the concentration camp. I learned this horrible news from the international media. She was 78 years old at that time. 2020 last year, exactly one year before, I got second heartbreaking news. My father passed away. I learned this new Global Times for the, from the Chinese newspaper. But still, I have no idea when, which condition, where is my uh, father passed away. Even still, I have no idea. And even I, I don't know the symmetry of my uh, parents. Today is 21st century. But I couldn't get access. But China continue liar. No, it is everybody can access. 2019, during the Human Rights Council section is the United Nations Human Rights Council. I give the testimony, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, World Uyghur Congress organizes one side event. And I was one of the speaker. I speak all this, Chinese mission was there. He said, is it denied everything? I told him, look, mister, maybe my phone doesn't work, but your phone should be work. Could you please help me to communicate to, uh, and uh, get some information from, uh, from my family? He didn't answer to me. So, so far, almost more than four, more, four years, I haven't contacted any uh, family member. But just uh, as I said, we got time to time very heartbreaking news. And my older brother, he is the mathematics professor. He is the mathematics professor, one of the college in my hometown. I uh, uh, heard recently he sentenced 17 years as a separatist. My younger brother, Kishtar Isa, he disappeared since 2016. I completely no idea he's still alive or died or where is this. This is the situation. This is, of, of course, this is my personal story, but this is the very general uh, situation today. Most of them Uyghur who living in the Europe United States, Turkey, some, some other part of the world. I can say more than 80, 90% Uyghur uh, have the same, uh, same condition. Even some Uyghur story, horrible than my story. But China continually and uh, uh, in the denied everything and the harassment, the punishment of the Uyghur diaspora, anyone who dare to speak out. You know? And the growing up the international pressure, Chinese government, and they change the narrative all the time. Until 2018, August, China denied everything. Then United Nations Committee eliminated racial discrimination committee and the publishes report and, the, and the, uh, uh, as I said at the beginning, this is one million Uyghurs, this is the UN language, United Nations language. Then China and the changing language, yes, we have uh, some such kind of uh, camp, but it is not vocational. Uh, this is not uh, concentration camp or detention camp. It is vocational training center. We we eradicated. We are uh, training to the young generation for the future, uh, better future. But so many intellectuals, Monica already saying, so many arts, so many singer, so many professor, even pro uh, president of the Xinjiang University, Tashpla uh, Tip. Uh, president of the Xinjiang Medical University, Halmrat Gopur, they are very respectful scholar, but they are disappeared. They are concentration camp today. So they are no need to re-educate it. And uh, then this shows the uh, international uh, uh, organization, World Trade Congress, we, we rise this, provide this information. Then China changing narrative again saying, yes, we are fighting terrorism and radicalism because we are Muslim 
very easy to, to, to use this terrorism, this language, then crack down. But there is, there is no reason. You, okay, you can fight. If there is exist any terrorism, you can fight. But you, you cannot lock down this more than 3 million people to the concentration camp. But it is the reality. Then, but in, in growing up international pressure in the United Nations, so many countries and published a uh, joint statement then China saying in 2019, well, oh, this all student graduate, then they are now is uh, working. Uh, they already provide a wonderful life to them. But since the 2019, this all Uyghurs and the detainer to use the forced labor, forced labor. Today, so many Western company has a direct link for the forced labor and the slavery with 21st century. Yeah, this is the situation. This is all things was happening. And in the past, since the, that's the uh, 2000, after Xi Jinping took the power. Before the Xi Jinping took the power 2014, and the assimilation policy, discrimination, human rights violation is, was the, happening all the time. But since, since the 2014, Chinese government, Chinese Communist Party abandoned from the assimilation policy turned into the genocidal and the gen genocidal policy today. No, it is that's why we are saying no, and the Chinese government really and the committed uh, 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 genocide against the Uyghurs. Thank you, Dolkun, for your words. Many organizations speak of genocide. Definitely cultural genocide, for sure, is taking place in Xinjiang, in this place with a population of 26 million. I'll now give the floor to Ithaskun Bilbao of Renew Europe, who promoted uh, Ilhan Toti's uh, candidacy for the Saharov Award, and uh, you know she'll tell us what, what we what's being done to hold China responsible. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Sergi, for organizing this. Um, Thank you to all of you who have joined us. Thank you, Dolkun, and um, our, uh, my condolences for what you're experiencing and my support for what you're trying to achieve because you're trying to build peace in the world by defending minorities. The quality of a state, of a democracy, is defined by the way it treats minorities. The safeguards of a democratic regime are not something that we can say exist in China. But the question is, what is the European Union doing? What are in European institutions doing? In the European Parliament, we're trying to uh, address all sorts of matters from cultural issues to the arrest and detention of activists or artists or human rights defenders and anybody uh, who belongs to this minority. Since you've mentioned the resolution that the European Parliament passed in December, in December of 2020, well, the truth is that it's the most important resolution we've adopted so far because it denounces and condemns as we've been doing since 2009, but it also particularly denounces digital surveillance of people. And there's something else which I've been learning about for the past few days because the government of China made a mobile app available to people so that they could share pictures and thoughts and so forth. This was made for Muslims. And that was exactly the tool that the government of China used to uh, do, so perform surveillance of them. And that was already denounced a couple of years ago in our original resolution. But this new resolution should really be used as a benchmark because it takes on board all of the resolutions of the European Parliament. It doesn't just denounce the forced labor to which Uyghurs are being subjected, especially in the textile industry. We also 
denounce the fact that many multinational companies and businesses are using this kind of forced labor. Dombrovsky um, already uh, pointed this out uh, on behalf of the European uh, Commission. But the European Parliament resolution goes further. It says we need to have tools to determine whether any biz, any company is involved in this sort of thing so that we can take steps about that. So the European Parliament will have a resolution uh, demanding due diligence of all companies operating in China so that they can uh, really commit to uh, uh, guarantee how their products are being made. And beyond that, there's something else. Uh, you know, beyond the forced labor, the detainment and the disappearances and, and, and all that, we have also denounced mass sterilization promoted of, of women promoted by the Chinese government. And so this is something that's, uh, that involves you know, cultural, social and economic measures to get rid of a minority because it's seen as a threat. <laughs> I won't reiterate these points because you've made them, but the point is that they're intervening in the freedom and the sexual uh, freedom of women. This is an invasion of their human rights. So uh, this invasion uh, and this surveillance using mobile phones and other devices, theaters, petrol stations, anytime anybody uses a card to communicate they can be stopped and detained to see what they've got on their phone, as you've said. And as you've said, there has to be a reaction by China. China has to allow free access by international observers. China has to open up the door so that we can find out what's going on. There must also be a mission from the European Parliament that can go and see people there, see what's happening, talk to all of the um, protagonists and, and find out what's happening. We need to den further denounce these mass campaigns of sterilization as well. and. In previous resolutions, we have uh, spoken out against measures taken by countries, for example, uh, in in favor of uh, measures taken by China, sorry, by Germany and other countries, just interpreted correct, because they have suspended uh, repatriation of uh, people to uh, the region, to China. They are protecting the refugees. We need international coordination on uh, our reaction in other recent conflicts. To give you an example, the peace agreement in uh, Northern Ireland, it's a very different, different case, of course, but the point is that uh, without the coordination among governments, that kind of agreement would not have been possible. So what can we do now? Well, the European Commission, has found itself facing a global agreement on investments in China. And we have expressed the demand that there must include clauses on the defense of human rights and uh, to prevent forced labor. Those are the terms that we are trying to make progress on uh, from Europe's institutions. It is true, as has been said, between uh, an, an agreement between the EU and uh, China. China has affirmed that all human rights are uh, indivisible and universal. They've affirmed that. But the question is, what can we do when they're being infringed? They have to let us in. There can be no agreement if there is no uh, requirements on uh, human rights and the elimination of these forms of discrimination. And we need to support the dialogue too, because dialogue we think can be a tool for progress, but this bilateral dialogue must include a very major chapter on human rights. Otherwise we cannot uh, close our eyes. We don't have our eyes closed. But what else can we do? You might say, well, the European Parliament needs to be able to make majority progress along the lines that we have suggested. But uh, 
we've asked in various resolutions that uh, consideration be given to the possibility of uh, applying individual sanctions to persons responsible for these crimes. So well, that's something that we've expressed the possibility of, but there's no unanimity in favor of that. And that's one of the problems facing Europe right now, because the European Parliament says yes, the Commission says yes, but it has to be agreed upon by the uh, European Council, where all the member states are represented. And that's where we generally don't get unanimity for more vigorous measures, for more stringent measures. And in debates, there are people who say no to dialogue, no to trade agreements. But I say that properly used dialogues and trade agreements can be a good instrument to make progress, to ensure that doors are opened and so, so that we can stand side by side with the Uyghurs and especially defend minorities. Minorities, uh, minorities are perceived to be a threat right across the globe. We're not integrating uh, measures properly. I mean, in Europe, we say we're united in diversity, but we're not always successful in integrating our diversity, even in Europe. And yet we're denouncing what's happening in China. So we believe, we hope that with these me uh, measures that we're setting out, we can make progress in the future. We need to go on denouncing and condemning and expressing the need to go further. And so with enthusiasm, I'm referring to the new legislation that I hope will require due diligence from EU companies, because that would be a way of bringing an end to forced labor if we make EU companies responsible for that kind of thing. So that, that is no longer is profitable for China. I could say much more, but I'm going to stop now. I just wanted to express that we have this firm position in the European Parliament. Thank you, Isoskun. You made two uh, key points, I believe. Firstly, you referred to the digital surveillance that's taking place right across Xinjiang province. I wanted to mention an anecdote that I thought was meaningful when I had uh, uh, contacts with representatives of the, of the diaspora. They said that they ha have Uyghurs who are abroad who want to communicate with their families. They're so scared of the regime. They're so frightened uh, of surveillance that they don't want to use voice. They use things like Zoom and Skype with a blackboard or a whiteboard behind and they write the messages on the board because they don't want to use their voice because their voice could be detected and investigated and lead through to the detention and the arrest of family members. It's gone that far. It's gone that far. Unfortunately, this is one of the most tragic aspects of the situation. And then there's the campaign of uh, forced sterilization that started in Xinjiang in 2016. As a journalist, we found it very difficult to report on this. The problem is that if we uh, interview somebody in Xinjiang, even if they just say good morning uh, on camera, then they're going to be arrested. And we found it very difficult to find people who've, who were camp survivors, who would survived the camps and could tell us about their experience. And forced sterilization, we were being told about in vague terms, but there was no way we could check upon what the actual extent of the phenomenon was and see what the truth was. But it's been a short period of time, the last four or six years, so many women have found, oh, they're unable to reproduce, they're unable to get pregnant. And I want to give the floor now to Daniel Grasso, who is a member of the ICIJ, and one of the people who've been working most on China cables, the huge investigation on these events in Xinjiang and on the re-education camps there. I wanted to ask you, Daniele, over and above uh, your general introduction to the issues, how difficult was it to work in this context of silence? There's almost a, a, a silence being decreed around issues to do with Uyghurs. Daniele. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Working on the basis of documents has not been easy, as you've said. It's very difficult to research what's happening there from abroad. You have to use um, indirect methods. 
the ICIJ has used materials uh, that have been published in El País in Spain. This is known as China Cables. This began with a series of documents that reached the International Council on Investigative Journalism, ICIJ, not through a direct source, but via somebody else. And there weren't many documents were accustomed to huge uh, dumps of information on the on the uh, internet, but this was just around 15 documents, but they were sufficient for us to find out things we didn't know about Xinjiang yet. They were internal documents with the name and the signature of high ranking officials in uh, China's regime who were responsible for governing uh, uh, and are responsible for this uh, um, concentration camp system. There were a series of telegrams and internal bulletins signed by uh, the person responsible for security in Xinjiang province, taking decisions on what should be done and uh, how people should be dealt with. These are documents that we ran past dozens of experts and people who had been working in close conjunction with uh, the Chinese government. They were able to, to look at these documents and, and gauge with their authenticity. Uh, and uh, the result was that this was absolutely in line with the denunciations we'd heard from camp survivors earlier. These were documents from 2017. I don't want to go into a lot of details, but I'll give you a couple of examples. We spoke of the numbers. A lot of people talk about one million people in the camps, according to the UN, but we were very struck. One of these documents, there's a table, like an Excel table, where the Chinese government states how many people they've succeeded in identifying as extremists in a single week in June. They talk about 24,000 people in the Muslim minority identified as, as, as suspect persons, 706 sent to camps and 15,000 which uh, who, who, who should be put into camps. So that's 15,600 people who on the basis of uh, suspicions will be put into a, a, um, a camp in a week. So essentially that bore out, that proved what we'd already uh, suspected due to people's uh, denunciations and complaints. And there were many other details as well on an area referred to by Zaskun earlier, which is surveillance through platforms and through uh, new technology. There's a document of around 11 pages with a lucid description of the development of a mobile app, a very simple app for the exchange of documents between people who are uh, in proximity one to another without having to be on internet nor pay anything. This is an app which is on the face of it is intended for people in countries where internet isn't that far so people can share text archives if you read the um, instructions it seems like a good app a very attractive app especially for young people who like to share uh, texts and they may not think uh, twice before they share certain texts or pictures or phrases and then this this app was developed uh, with Chinese money in California, and this app, which is called Zapia, in the West is called Zapia, and it acquired a lot of users, not just in China and in Xinjiang, but also in India and in Myanmar, which are two other countries where we've seen governmental repression and the effects thereof over recent years. So Zapia works like Big Brother, because in the case of China, the government is monitoring the texts and images that are sent. We've found people who were detained the morning after having sent a, a screenshot of a page from the Quran to a friend. And the document that was leaked gave 
details on how many hundreds of thousands of people were successfully being monitored and spied upon through this app and how it works like a great eye in the sky, a great technological big brother in these, and, and the use of a Zapier leads directly through to people being detained, arrested. There was another very interesting document which actually wasn't a secret one because all of the others were, had been classified as secret by the government. But this other one set out uh, uh, the human side of trials of people living in Xinjiang. This was a, a judicial case brought against a person in Xinjiang who was sentenced to 10 years in prison simply because he told his colleagues at work that they should pray five times a day. 10 year prison sentence, and that gives you some idea of the extent of repression. I would add another note. Uh, all of these documents date from 2017, which is the very year that we began to hear the voices of people who managed to get away from these camps. And that was the year where we people outside China were beginning to talk about these uh, internment camps. And 2017 was also the year in which uh, internments really took off, um, increased exponentially. And so that's the, the year that was the beginning of the end of the hermetic control that China wanted to have on the information on the situation. So this was official information but when it came to publishing it, as Monica said, uh, for, for journalists in China, it was a problem. It's difficult to even talk to somebody there. So none of the media that published these, uh, none of the 17 media that published these documents uh, mentioned any of their contacts, any of their sources in China, because obviously that would have compromised them and uh, jeopardized their future. I think it's really important for these documents to have come to light because they were the last piece of evidence that was needed to bear out uh, in writing the, the, something that had been denounced for quite a few years now. Thank you. We'll now start the question and answer session. So please ask your questions in the chat box. I'm going to be telling you about my work there. I mean, it's difficult to work on the spot, as Daniele pointed out. A lot of the work here has been done by European academics who have been investigating repression against the, U the Uyghurs since uh, last century, in fact. One of the most shocking reports, I think, was one by a Canadian, Matt Myler, about a very interesting program of the Chinese government. One point about the Chinese regime is that it doesn't leave anything to chance ever. This was a program about sending representatives of the regime, Communist Party, Chinese Communist Party representatives into Xinjiang you know, on behalf of one of the companies or whatever, but they were assigned to spend a holiday, as it were, in a family home, you know, to live with a family for up to 14 days. But basically what they were meant to do was spy on these families to confirm that they were loyal to the Chinese regime. Interestingly, when I talked to this researcher and I spoke to some of the families that had experienced this sort of thing, we had this Han Chinese person who would live with the family for a period of time, including sleeping in their sleeping quarters. But Xinjiang is a very modest place. So, uh, you know, uh, basically bedrooms consist of, of, of taking an, an ordinary room and, and, and putting mattresses on the floor. So a foreigner, uh, well, you know, Han Chinese, uh, in other words, an outsider rather, uh, somebody who was not a member of the family would have to sleep with the rest of the family. And then they would check on the children. You know, they would go to the market and they would come back with a bag of 
of, of, of meat. And of course, if the family asked what kind of meat it was, then they were assumed to be Muslim because they were checking whether the meat was haram or not. And another thing they would do was ask the children, does your, does your father pray? Uh, does your father have some kind of Islamic text in the house that we can't see? So they really leave nothing to, ch to chance. They check uh, people's loyalty to the point of uh, you know, asking children to turn in their parents. Children who are indoctrinated in school to report their parents if they were practicing Muslims. And I'm sure that will lead to untold trauma in the future. So while I'm waiting for questions from the audience, I have a question for Isaskun. I'm sure you, maybe Dolkun can tell us some more about Ilham, Ilham Tohti's situation. I think he was sentenced, he was given a life sentence, I believe. But, you know, can you tell us what you know of him currently? Well, all of these documents, this resolution and all uh, sorts of earlier resolutions seek his release. We want, we also try to find out what uh, what's going on with him, but we don't know what his situation is. When we go back to our follow-up on all Zakharov Award recipients who are detained and try to find out how they're doing, well, uh, I mean, we're, we're constantly doing follow-up work on him as well as the others. Okay, Dolkun, can you tell us a bit more? Sure. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm a, a very, uh, very, very seldom one of the person who met Ilham Tohti in person, because when I was staying in Beijing 1990 to 1994, that time Ilham Tohti, he was uh, the uh, uh, Chinese National University. He was the man, my good friend, of course. That time he was not very active for this issue, but later he educated Uyghurs. Uh, right. Actually, Ilham Tohti, uh, all we know, Ilham Tohti, he, he is completely innocent person. He never against the Chinese constitution or never against the Chinese policy or autonomic law. Just he, ha he had trying to set up the uh, dialogue between the Uyghur and the Chinese government. Actually, he trying to help to the Chinese government to fix the problem. But because of the ethnicity, because of the ethnicity, because he's the Uyghurs. Look, this is the very clear evidence how Chinese Communist Party treats the Uyghurs. Chinese government or Chinese Communist Party has no any intention to solve the problem. Chinese government very clearly, so I have a power, I can do anything, just you will be turning, you will be turned to Chinese or you will be you, you don't have a space to live in. You will be died. This is the policy of the Chinese government. This Ilham Tohti is the, just a simple, simple example for the Uyghur, Uyghur, Uyghur intellectuals. He never against the Chinese government. He never against the Chinese uh, uh, law, but he sentenced to life. So after he sentenced, of course, and the European parliament uh, gives a Sakharov prize to him. It is the really, uh, incredible important act support to the European Parliament towards the Uyghur community. It's a big hope to the Uyghur people. Almost was mm -hmm. a man, yes. But unfortunately, situation not changing. He's still in the jail. Even just last month, I had, I, I, I attended the same uh, uh, panel with his daughter, Jafar Ilham. I talked with her, with her. even he, she also before 2017, there, is, there was a little bit of uh, space she uh, or her, her family member can talk Ilham Tohti once or twice a year. But since 2017, completely banned all communication. Since 2017, no single information. So we don't know. We hope he's still alive, but we don't know he's still alive, what condition, what is his uh, healthy. Uh, we couldn't get any single information uh, uh, for, uh, about him. So it is the it is the thing. So European Parliament gives a prize, the Sakharov Prize, to him. Uh, but 
so far we we haven't seen any real act from the European Commission or European Council really did some act and uh, uh, between China because the European Union had the human rights dialogue between China and the European Union. Uh, well, the European Union all the time raised the human rights issue very used very soft language, uh, but you know still is Ilham Tok in the jail. So many Chinese human rights defender in the jail, Tibetan human rights defender in the jail. So nothing is changed. Uh, but today is unfortunately the European Union continue to make business with China, even and the EU China comprehensive agreement investment uh, trade also signed. The sister really uh, a, a shame situation, but uh, however, uh, he got the Saharov Prize. It is mean, he is not, uh, it is because European Parliament, such a, such a serious institution, never give a, such a prize to some criminal. So, and uh, if, if European Parliament recognize his human rights uh, work, then there is some uh, responsibility uh, to save his life. For the European institution. Thank you. Gracias, Dolkun. Os voy a trasladar una pregunta. Thank you, Dolkun. I have one question, two questions, in fact, one for Isaskun and one for Dolkun Isa. These are questions from Miguel Pastor Moreno. He says, the European Union is the largest uh, air region of the world with a shared uh, defense of human rights and should therefore be a global exponent of human rights. So the question is, uh, will the signature of the investment agreement with China be allowed by the European Parliament? Secondly, will the European Parliament adopt sanctions not only for private individuals and specific uh, businesses involved in repression, but to, to the, comp the, the, the state of China as such? Well, in terms of the trade agreement, uh, it's quite controversial. Oh, by the way, Miguel, good afternoon. I know Miguel, I haven't seen him in a long time, so please allow me to greet him warmly. So Miguel, uh, we don't know yet whether there will be such a trade agreement. There are disagreements amongst the, Europe, the, the political groups in the European Parliament and within them. The European Commission does not yet have the European Council's approval for its idea to have you know, a bilateral agenda with China with uh, you know a strategic cooperation agenda on, on, in a number of different areas four areas one of them is peace and security peace and security and in that particular chapter for cooperation that's cooperation not uh, not trade there is uh, some language about uh, the importance to, of working on human rights in a way that's constructive and mutually respectful. In any case, the European Commission has considered this uh, something that needs to be tackled. Then there's speech of, there's language about sustainability and exchange amongst peoples and so forth. Now, why has the Commission broached this bilateral agenda? Because some countries in the European Union already have bilateral agreements or agendas with China. And my personal thinking is that it's better for us to have a single bilateral arrangement between the European Union and China so that we can try and reach a single position to try and uphold human rights and European values there. This cooperation might allow us to continue to move forward along these lines. Obviously, we have to condemn what's happening. Obviously, we have to speak uh, in, in very uh, in harsh words where, it, where necessary. We need to, uh, to tell them that they need to put an end to this uh, discrimination and ill treatment of minorities. But the cooperation agenda is going to be brought forward. And it's it's what the European Commission intends to use to uphold human rights. As for sanctions, the European Parliament has indeed in a number of resolutions 
raise the possibility of targeted sanctions, selective sanctions, not a sa sanctions against China at large, but certainly sanctions against the authorities who give the orders for this kind of measure. Obviously, this is something that we can't do at the European Parliament's initiative alone. We need the European Commission to support us and the member states. And that's why it's so difficult, because we don't have unanimity. The same goes for other countries as well. For instance, uh, you know, in the case of, of China, there was quite a controversy not that many days ago. And this, of course, is weakening the European Union's position. We need to move forward for global peace. Uh, in that context, I think this could be a way to uh, move forward. But it's, it's certainly true that when there's any kind of problem in the European Union, the European institutions tell us that's an internal problem of that particular member state. It's not a European Union problem. And some people are ensconced in that logic. They interpret this problem as an internal problem to be addressed by the country's government. And then another issue uh, Dolkun raised earlier is the idea that any kind of defense of your culture, your identity, or your religion is an act of terrorism, an act of terror. There, there's something wrong about that, but certain parties are particularly receptive to this particular um, approach. Uh, I mean, even though we all know that this is about assimilation and about getting rid of a minority. Yes, I suppose it's also a, a bad time to uh, to to get uh, China uh, to. Uh, uh, to hold China to account. I also have a question for Dolkun. Uh, so what kind of support do you receive as the uh, World Uyghur Congress from institutions like the European Union or whatever? Well, to, uh, to be honestly, <laughs> so far, uh, we got very little uh, support from the European Union. This is mostly moral and uh, 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 support, of course. So far, uh, European Parliament uh, were, were, were quite uh, active for this atrocity. Since 2018, until now, four uh, resolution approved passed by the uh, European Parliament in Strasbourg. Last resolution was uh, 2020, uh, 17 of December last year, just two months ago. A very strong, used a very strong language, very strong, powerful. Uh, resolution and 2018 October and 2019 April 2019 December also other three resolution approved by 2016 yeah. 2011 and 2016 2011 2009 exactly, yeah. Yeah. yeah so I'm talking about just up to the concentration camp start but before of course and the European Parliament also approved mm. the resolution on we were called trip uh, because 2008, 2009, Chinese government trying to destroy all cultural heritage, particularly Kashgar city, 75 percentage cultural heritage culturally destroyed. That time, to, to, uh, 2012, European mm. Parliament also passed the original resolution to ask the Chinese government to stop this uh, destroyed cultural uh, uh, heritage. So, at this 2018, after this uh, concentration camp and accept and realize by the internationally, then European Parliament passed at least four resolution. It is the uh, big meaning for us. Uh, it is the big support. Uh, but as I said, European Commission or European Council still silent on this, for example, you know, in the U U U uh, US government already uh, recognized and declared it is a genocide, genocide designation, what's the going on for the, for the Uyghur. Canadian Parliament uh, Subcommission also uh, recognized as a genocide this. And the uh, Essex Court Chambers also uh, two weeks ago in the UK also, and the uh, opinion, published opinion, this legal opinion, all this. 
But however, EU and its member states have remained silent on this issue of the genocide. Uh, however, we have seen some positive, uh, positive steps at the UN level, UN Human Rights Council level, UN, uh, UN, High, Co UN uh, uh, High Commissioner for the Human Rights, uh, she raises issue a couple of times. She asked a Chinese government to visit Turkestan, to visit the concentration camp. And the Chinese government also, Chinese mission say, yeah, okay, you're welcome. But so far, almost two years, this visit was not happening. We are really surprised. Why? What is the reason? High commissioner, she wants to go. Chinese government say, okay, you will come, but still not happening. This is the uh, yeah, and the second issue. Yes, so they're far, not letting so her. So many, so many uh, people. Even one million is uh, UN language. One million. We, we believe more than three million people is a concentration camp. But UN Secretary General Guterres never mentions this issue. Almost four years, he never rises, he never made a single statement on the concentration camp today. And then no, no even UN Human Rights Council, uh, Human Rights Council, and they never held any special sanction, a uh, special section, not a special debate for the concentration camp. Only some country, 2019, 22 country, and it made it join this statement, mostly European country, United States and uh, uh, Australia, Western, uh, Demo Western uh, democratic country, uh, join this statement, 22 later three country join this, 25 country, but China mobilized another 50 country. Then another 50 country support Chinese government and uh, uh, against the, uh, the saying is right. And the, is the Chinese government policy towards Uyghur is correct, you know, 50 country. But however, last year, 2020, 39 countries, this country is growing up, 39 country made jointly statement and uh, 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 condemning the Chinese government, ask Chinese government should be a close this concentration camp and then a lot UN fought, finding mission to visit East Turkestan for the Uyghur region, but, but still not happening. Uh, but China is very powerful, mm -hmm. in the, particularly UN and some other international uh, uh, institution. Uh, I, have, I have been attending UN meeting uh, since many years, but I have seen and personally, China use its power trying to stop Uyghur activists, Tibet activists to attend the UN meeting. Even I was kicked out from the UN 2017 in New York when I was attending UN permanent from indigenous issue from uh, day of three, I was kicked out from the UN without any explanation, you know? Yeah, and the time to time, I had faced same situation in same problem in the Geneva as well, because China used its power, make pressure to the UN and the monopolize the UN human rights system. Even Chinese long arm getting to the European Union as well today, Interpol, World Health Health Organization. So that's why most of some international organization, AU, United Nations, or some other international organization, they are speaking sometimes, but we haven't seen any act. If just speaking, not talking, just talking, not working, not solve this problem. Should the, the European Union, because democracy, human rights, rule of law, Transparency is a basic value of Western democracy, European Union. But unfortunately, we have seen since 2017, just this morning, I have seen one of the article, uh, source, uh, source, uh, what is, source, uh, source China Morning Post, saying since 2017 until now, three, three years, and 2,763 percentage and the, uh, the more, uh, the, uh, more and the business between China and the, and the, in the Germany uh, particularly. So huge numbers uh, it is. So it is one side, oh, you have to stop the human rights violation and the other side continue to make business and the provide technology is already, uh, Bilbao uh, is just already talking about the civilian technology. 
This technology, so many Western companies, European companies still provide this technology to China today. China tested facial recognition, voice recognition technology on the Uyghur today, then use other provinces in China, then Hong Kong. Today, more than, uh, the more than 20 country import Chinese technology, several land technology to, to monitoring freedom of expression, uh, freedom of movement, and the use of uh, urban citizen. So uh, that's why we can see uh, sometimes the European countries speaking up, uh, but uh, we have seen not really uh, concrete action, and we haven't seen any visible uh, support from the European country, unfortunately. Okay, one last question before we wind up this discussion. Guillermo Palomar from Madrid has a question. It may be complex, uh, but perhaps this asking the best uh, person to uh, answer this question. What international measures can be taken uh, to demand an end to this uh, attitude by uh, the Chinese government. What about uh, universal jurisdiction? That's difficult. Or could there be inquiries or committed to inquiry in the UN? This morning, when there was reference to mass sterilization campaigns against Uyghur women, I remembered Peruvian women who, uh, in the, under the government of Fujimori, suffered uh, of these mass sterilization campaigns and the trials are taking place now, years later, because there was an international reaction, but especially because there was a, a determination on the part of political parties and organizations in Peru to judge that historical juncture and period and to, and to bring to book those responsible for those uh, crimes against human rights in Peru. And right now, I think that what you're saying would be viable, but a lot of conditions would have to be lined up. It is the case the United Nations has made many statements, but we would need one single voice to demand I don't really see uh, China being brought to dock in an international court unless, as Dolkun said, we can speak with one single voice to demand that China cooperate in the preparation of a report by the United Nations so we all together bring pressure to bear so that things change. That is a theoretical possibility, but right now, I don't think it's feasible. We don't have the tools because there isn't a clear political will on the part of all of the uh, protagonists who could do this. Nor is it the case in China either. If we saw that China wanted to change, or if we saw that there was opposition within China, um, that would be a different time. But what we've seen in recent years is that the situation has got worse, and there's been much more arrests, much more uh, surveillance, and they're using technology not to favor society, but to bring it further under uh, control, under uh, subjugation, and I don't really see that the conditions are met for such an uh, international mm, demand against China. And what was said earlier, uh, they say, oh, they're attacking our national uh, territorial integrity, which is something that a lot of people from irrationally are afraid of. So China often, even in official documents, say, well, um, Providing our national integrity is respected, then I might be able to make a deal with you. And that's the point. That's the point. If they say that to certain member states, then our member states will say, oh, that's a taboo. Can't go down that road, because otherwise maybe China in the future is going to come to me and say, ah, oh, we want you to solve your domestic problems. Uh, what about... Uh, territorial unity and national sovereignty then. That's the problem with certain uh, member states. This is the kind of mechanism that uh, is in play in the institutions in Europe. It might seem ridiculous to be so scared of a minority 
when you're so huge, what have you got to be scared of? At the end of the day, it's just an incapacity to take on board the fact that a minority is added value for a country. A minority is a bonus for a country. And we're going to go on making these demands to ensure that progress can be made because our European values do not tally with what's happening, which is the extermination of minorities because of their religious, cultural uh, identity and or because uh, they are in a certain area and they are perceived to be threatening China's territorial integrity. Thank you. Thank you very much. The only way to combat this uh, minimization of the importance of the Uyghurs is through uh, uh, coordinated international uh, activity. We've seen Tibet in the past. We may see Hong Kong in the future. We may see Taiwan in the future as well. So the only thing to do is to uh, bring uh, the international pressure to bear as soon as possible. It only remains to me to thank you all uh, for what you've said. Thank everybody who's attended in this event to prevent uh, abuses of human rights in China. Thank you to the Europe Parliament, European Parliament. Thank you all very much. Mrs. Bill says thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. See thank you. you so see much. you soon. Yeah, thank you. Muchas gracias de parte de Isa.